Hi all, and good luck on the exam. Uh, I just wanted to give you one last problem. If you get stuck on the exam, and if you want a little bit more inspiration for some of the problems. So, in this problem, this is a modification from one in Rudin. We have a sequence of functions, fn e to r, gn e to r. These are converging uniformly on a set E, their domain, to functions f and g, respectively. And uh, suppose that there also exists an m so that the function fn is bounded from above by n, m for all x and e, and for all n natural numbers. And similarly, the function g is bounded from above by m for all x for all n. We want to show that fn times gn converges uniformly to f times g. Now, one remark. If you fix a z in E, then fn of z times gn of z, the limit of this, now this is the product of two numbers, fn of z and gn of z, it converges to the limit of the, each of the products. Now the first one is converging to f of z, and the second one is converging to g of z, so the product converges to f times g by 131a. So we are applying it to the sequence a n equals f n of z and b n is equal to g n of z. So apply product limit law to, we don't have to say this, you can just save one by one. So pointwise convergence is easy this would prove pointwise convergence. The issue is that we need to say that this difference between these quantities, that is how far this is for a given n and z from the limit, is uniform in z or can be made uniformly small in n. Here, we're just saying that for large n, this product is close to this product. Okay, so let's prove the uniform convergence. Suppose fn, gn, f, and g are as stated. Uh, one could say that E is also as stated here. So everything in the problem has to be defined. There's a small side, side argument here. I mean, remember that if you are proving uniform convergence, you should be making some choices. And these are logically often convenient to make after the setup. This is because these choices will be what you event, I mean, mainly you're choosing a capital N. But to choose that, you will have to do some preliminary checks often. And you cannot choose it before you have fixed all those checks. So we'll, I'll say a little bit soon what this is and how we apply that. But the second thing, Every proof, okay, always you have a setup. Usually you have choices, especially choice of n. In the case of convergence or choice of delta, if you are in continuity case, but regardless of proofs of continuity or convergence, what's in common between them is that you have to estimate. Here we're saying that the product of fn and gn is converging to the product of f and g. So as n goes off to infinity. And we're saying more that we can estimate this, this error in this approximation uniformly by epsilon once n is big enough. And that's the choice that we have yet to make. But to do that, our first step is to figure out how to estimate. And when you are working with sequences, there is a common trick of subtracting and adding the function or the fn in order to get the difference in here. 
The difference is in here because we want to, we know that Fn converges to F, so these differences can be estimated by epsilon as desired. But okay, so we, in the product case, we have to add the subtract the FF as a factor with GN as a factor. Well, that forces us to add f of x back with g of n as a factor. So now these two current terms cancel. But then what we have is the, the other term minus f of x times g of x. So we're left with g of n f x minus g x, absolute value. Okay, so we have two terms. Let's try to split these up into the differences. So we get from the first term, we get g of n, absolute value of g n of x, f n of x minus f of x by the triangle inequality. And then the second term gives us absolute value of f of x times g n of x minus g of x. Okay. So now what we want to, well, let's see what we can do. We have, and we should say here, M is as in the assumptions as well. So we know by assumption that G N of X is less than M for all X. At this point, you might recall how we did this in 131A. This is always when you have a product of two things, the first step behaves similarly. One of these is a difference, but then it's multiplied by something, and that multi something needs to be bounded. In this case, the bound comes from our assumption, so it's a little bit easier than in 131a. However, the second term, we need a bound for it, because what the idea here with these terms and this estimate is that one of these is small and the other one is bounded, the product of a bounded and something small is going to be small bounded. Now, if you wanted to put a difference here and replace it with Fn, you could do a subtract and add trick. But instead, I will do this in a different way, which is a little bit better, and it's also a good technique to know. So the, what's the difference between, I mean, we want to put an M here, but what's the difference between this and the assumption? In the assumption, go back to it, we had f n of x is less, absolute value is less than m. Here we don't have the n. If we had an n here, we could replace it with an m. And that's what we did with the g. But here we don't have an assumption talking about f of x being bounded. So that's something that we would have to prove if we want to use here. So there's just this small argument that's good to know for its own sake. If you fix a Z in the space E, and usually I'd use an X here, but because I'm using it's down there, I don't want to cause ambiguity. So if Z is an E, any point, then we know that the seek limit of this these numbers, F and Z, is equal to F. This is by assumption because the sequence converges uniformly, therefore it also converges pointwise. So fixing a Z, you get a convergence sequence of real numbers that converges to this other real number. Now this sequence of real numbers, if we want to, you can call it AN, but I'm not doing it in this write-up. This sequence of real numbers is always less than or equal to M. So by 131A, we know that any limit of such a sequence, which is unique, f of z, would also be less than or equal to m. Well, this is exactly what we wanted to show. So for all z, what this proves, for all z, f of z, absolute, and we should have absolute values here, and perhaps also absolute values there, is less than or equal to m. Now, small detail here would be that, okay, the assumption says that f and z converges to f of z, but this absolute value is also continuous, so you can put the absolute values there. So, 
if the by assumption of uniform convergence and since absolute value is continuous, we get that claim. Okay, now it's no longer needed. Okay, so now we get our bound. Here we used star, and here we used the assumption of boundedness. And it's a good practice, by the way, if if you can to indicate sort of what bound assumptions you are using at every stage. So if you're doing an inequality, you can always highlight those things. Okay, so now we want to make sure that this is less than epsilon. Well, this we can make less than epsilon over 2m by choosing a large m. And this we can make less than epsilon over 2m by choosing a large m. So we're left with an epsilon over 2m times m plus epsilon over 2m times m. And this is equal to epsilon now. So we're in the good case. But this is not true for all n. We have to make choices, and those choices have to be justified, so we have to state the definitions. Gn is converging uniformly. That means that there exists an ng such that for all n bigger than ng, if n is bigger than ng, then for all x in E, we have Gn of x minus G of x is less than epsilon. So for every epsilon positive, there is such. And uh, for every epsilon positive, there exists an NF for which the same claim holds, except with the F function replacing the G function. So with this all done, we are ready to write this proof and I should say we should also fix epsilon at some point. We could do do it in the setup, but I'll now exceptionally do it here. Fix epsilon positive. Now by one and two there exists N F and N G as stated, then choose n to be the maximum of these two, because we want to use both of these bounds here. And just one small correction, we do want the two m's there. So that's the choice that we make. Now, uniform continuity usually has this epsilon the same as that epsilon. So you could say, put an epsilon prime here to highlight that we're going to use it with a different epsilon, epsilon prime. There's this with epsilon prime is equal to epsilon over 2 then. And the reason why this can be, why we can set this epsilon prime now here is because this is true for all epsilon prime. No matter what epsilon prime you want, it would be true for one, it would be true for a million, it would be true for 10 to the minus six, but it's also true for epsilon over 2m because epsilon is positive, so epsilon over 2m is also positive. But now this gives us these magical numbers, n, f, n, g. We take the maximum of them. Now, if n is bigger than n, then this is true. And here you could add because n is also bigger than nf, because it's bigger than the maximum. And here it's because n is bigger than ng, and we're using the bound. So that concludes the proof. So just a summary of some of the techniques that were part of this video. First of all, Pointwise convergence is really often just convergence of real numbers. 
And you can use facts from 131A to study that. But to do that, usually you have to fix the points first, and that fixes the Z so that the function is just outputting some real numbers, and these are sequences of real numbers. This came up in our proof as well when we were talking about what happens to absolute value of f of z being bounded by m. Now, as always, our proofs have a setup, choices, and estimates. And your proof on the exams should show that. Here, we are looking at the product of two things, so we're estimate and convergence functions, so we're estimating f and g and minus f g. And we express them by this addition and subtraction trick that is very common in these problems using triangle inequality, again, very common. And then we combine it with the assumptions. Some of these can be bounded from above by m, and others we have to do a little bit of deduction first because the assumption is not exactly what we want, but very closely related to what we want. And then that will tell us how to make the choices and with, with which epsilon so that we can absorb them, the constant, and then get to the epsilon that we want at the end. Thank you for watching and good luck on the exam.